Okay. So this is this is one that is going to be a bit of a test or not a test, but um, we have a lot of people in, which is great because we want to talk about community. How do you organize a local group? What do you have to do to make people uh, join you? What are the things that we've learned from different countries? And to do that, we have a bunch of local organizers from different groups, large and small, joining us. I'll run through the names really quickly and then I'll ask them all to, to do a little uh, hi, I'm this person. Um, so I have Bonnie from Germany. I have Jamie from Switzerland. I have Italo from Italy. I have Leo from Switzerland. And then I have Roberto from Miami, which is the United States, if we're doing countries. Um, and then I have Christina in the background, who doesn't have her video on yet, from Buenos Aires. And that's all of them. Um, so we might as well start with Bonnie. You're the first in my, the first person I see. So um, a little introduction, please. Hi, I'm Bonnie from the FSFE. I'm a junior project manager there. And yeah, I work with local communities. And also recently bec I became a translator, the, the translator coordinator. And I also do the podcast um, the Zafra Freedom Podcast with my peers for the FSFE. Yeah, and I'm here and looking forward to the discussion about local group activism. So I would be done. Thank you. Uh, Jami. Hi, my real name is Gian Maria Daffre. Uh, as you said, I'm from Switzerland, originally from Italy. I am a member of the Free Software Foundation, but also of the Free Software Foundation Europe. And uh, in Zurich, I work as the country coordinator of Switzerland for the Free Software Foundation. Uh, marketing and sales guy, and working also as a project manager for my own company. Okay, uh, thank you very much for joining us. I'm gonna move on to Leo because Leo is, do I say Leo or Leah? Sorry. Leo, no, Leo is Sorry. fine. <laughs> no, <laughs> not an issue at all. Yeah, uh, my name is Leo, as you've mentioned. Um, I have been acting as a country coordinator for Switzerland for the last 12 years or so. Um, together with Jami as a local group leader in the last times. We had some different people in that position before. I have handed over now uh, to Jami because I have recently moved to France and maybe I'm still moving on. That's not, not yet sure, but yeah. We, have, uh, we can tell you a little bit of, of what we have achieved and how we have done it in Switzerland. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. Um, so you're in France now. I'm currently in France. <laughs> a lot of friends, a lot of people from France today. Um, yes. uh, moving on to Roberto. Hey everyone, I'm Roberto. I'm the founder of Libre Miami, uh, which is a local group here in Miami, and I'm also a web developer. And I'm really glad to be, uh, you know, representing the United States and Florida and Miami over here. <laughs> Had to talk. Thanks for joining us, Roberto. Um, Italo. Oh, Itano, I think you're muted. No, not muted. I think, am I the only one not hearing Italo? No, I also can't hear okay. I'm gonna move on to Christina then for a second. Uh, Christina, hi, good to see you. Um, hi. So you can introduce yourself. Sorry, Italo, I think something is happening with your sound. So uh, the uh, tech should work now. Oh, there you go. <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, uh, with big blue buttons, sometimes it happens. Uh, and um, so Italo Vignoli from Milano in Italy. I am uh, one of the founders of uh, the LibreOffice project. 
and I'm currently handling uh, marketing uh, and uh, community outreach for the LibreOffice project uh, at global level, but also uh, managing or trying to manage the Italian community, uh, which uh, as the Lib under the Libre Italia umbrella name for the LibreOffice project and contributing to several other projects as well. Lots to learn, I think, from Italo as well. Um, Christina, hi. <laughs> hi. A uh, little introduction? Yeah, sorry, I didn't speak English since several years. Um, well, I, I'm Christina from Buenos Aires, Arge Argentina, and I, I'm current, currently um, participating of on several uh, free software uh, clubs. I was founder of one uh, called Foike, but now it's not uh, functioning. Or why well, I don't. Know. Yeah, no, you're, are... fine. you're doing great. <laughs> okay, um, that's all. Okay. Um. I think probably the best thing to do to coordinate this, keep this a little coordinators, I guess is um, maybe ask everyone what the thing is that you think is the most important thing to get people involved locally, where you are. Uh, and I'm gonna start, I think, with Italo on that, just because I feel like uh, your um, experience will will sort of incentivize other people to think about different things as well. Okay, so it's um, uh, involving pe people in open source is not always uh, easy. Um, it, um, it and it's uh, a lot different uh, uh, country to country because uh, there are uh, uh, different habits, uh, different uh, cultural uh, um, point of view. Uh, different languages and of course uh, English is uh, often often a barrier to to contributing uh, uh, on a global project for instance uh, with LibreOffice uh, we have many local communities uh, uh, we have a huge community for instance in Indonesia uh, where uh, the people that is speaking English is just uh, a minority so we always try to uh, to mediate between uh, uh, having some people uh, connected to the to the center of the project, to the global project, uh, to to get uh, the information, and then the same people uh, um, translating the information and adapting the information for the local market. This is especially true for um, Asia. Uh, Asia has so many different languages. Uh, uh, that it makes uh, almost impossible for someone uh, who has a Western culture to understand them all. Uh, also, very different cultures in comparison with our, uh, at least with the European one, but in general with the uh, Western culture in in uh, in general. Um, also, we have a. Uh, also similar issues in South America where the majority of people speak Spanish uh, it's not fluent in English so uh, of course we try to have people uh, speak the local language uh, when presenting at conferences uh, this is one of the reason why I often visit South America because uh, uh, I speak a little bit of Spanish. I understand it perfectly. I understand perfectly Portuguese, but I can speak Spanish a little bit. So that makes it easier to keep the community together. Then if you go at local level, uh, of course, there are, there, are, there are a lot of local nuances in managing the community uh, in, uh, in, in a country. In Italy, for instance, we have uh, a lot of activities. Uh, um, we try to have a lot of activities at government level because uh, we have a law that usually that should mandate open source, uh, 
uh, but it's not really respected by many people. And of course, uh, the uh, proprietary software companies are trying to uh, find uh, uh, ways of uh, getting around the law uh, in a way that then uh, people is locked in in their software. We, for instance, during uh, COVID, uh, the COVID lockdown, we have seen uh, uh, Microsoft, the Google, uh, with their solutions trying to conquer schools and uh, so we have tried to to create some some alternatives uh, but of course uh, we uh, we have uh, we, we don't have the same uh, the same power in term of um, uh, ammunition they they have a lot of advertising money they have a lot of lobbying uh, money uh, and uh, sometimes it's difficult to uh, keep the pace of these companies. Um, of course, the activities at local level are in the native language, so everything that we do in in, Ita in Italy is in Italian. Uh, but we try uh, also another uh, thing that we try to do is to motivate uh, people that are. Uh, in local communities to be more active in the global one. So there are uh, many different levels where you can uh, uh, develop the community. Yeah. Uh, not always easy. Uh, nice challenge, uh, especially for elderly people like me. Uh, I find a lot of, uh, I find it really uh, exciting to transfer my knowledge to younger generation that this i think uh, makes me not only consuming oxygen but also doing something positive for the world <laughs> okay well this is very noble <laughs> i'm very happy to hear that um i think it's an interesting the 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 global versus local uh that you can talk about um i think i would love to hear a little bit about um your experiences in switzerland um both from Leo and Jamie, because from what I understand, Leo started it a little bit and then Jamie followed up, right? In in your work in Switzerland. Yeah, um, Jamie has just now recently followed up with my move to France. And uh, I have been responsible the last 10 or 12 years for the, uh, as a country coordinator and for the local group also in some time. Um, but the question was about how to get people on board, and I think this is, um, you, uh, Italo, you have mentioned a very important point with the language barrier. We also have this in some kind of form because the country is split to four language regions. Um, yeah, <laughs> so I know about this issue. Um, but on the other part, it's uh, more also about the local engagement, how we can bring people from the local communities to actually take part, or at the first point to know about us, because of course we are in some point visible because we do media work, we do presentations, we um, I do work at universities and things like this, but um, first of all, besides that, nobody knows about our activities, only if they see the results of them, um, which we present very obviously with our campaigns and, um, and our efforts in the media and all these kind of things. Um, but for us, it's really important that we have new members on board, that uh, uh, that it keeps going always, because otherwise it can happen that these local groups, I mean, we had also really different times. We had times where it was like three, four, we had times where it was 15, 20 people only in the local group in Zurich. Uh, I'm not sure, Jamie, how many people uh, usually take part now? Usually it's about eight people uh, eight to people take part. Now. We meet uh, one, one time per month in Zurich. Okay. So, uh, so the issue is mainly to get fresh blood into the system, <laughs> that it does not die out. And this is really difficult. And from my experience, I have been um, professionally working in the university spaces for the last um, uh, more than, uh, 15 years or something. Sorry, I'm not so good with the timeline. <laughs> 
Um, but uh, I think it is really important to engage students because students um, are like a multiplicators. If they have good experience with free software and mostly in technical universities, um, it can make a lot of sense. Um, because then these people, um, for example, organize also uh, Linux installation days and courses and things like this and uh, yeah bring bring the interest in the topic uh, because in generally um, yeah as I've mentioned if you don't know about it if you don't use the free software why you should want to join a local group uh, to help to make it better so first there must be a part to make free software known which is also the FSF doing really good work besides the FSFA of course we are all doing together really great work to make free software known so people use it but then we have to bring them to engage in that topic and this is also also I want, would like to hear also your experience um, what are your concepts to, to bring the people on board to fight for free software and, um, and to make build a movement and to keep it alive in long term so if I can add something, uh, basically we found out that just meeting, you know, one time per month, that's not enough. Basically, we have to go to the people. And we did this with uh, different workshops. Um, we also uh, helped in the repair cafes to make uh, GNU Linux installations. We had uh, people or we had workshops about setting their own servers and so on. And then uh, Leo, she mentioned that uh, about the media. So unfortunately, we are doing press releases about the, the things we do, you know, but let's say that the main mainstream media doesn't publish anything about us. It's mostly alternative media. And it, that's, that's really unfortunate. The other thing that is a little bit difficult is sometimes you have people visiting the local group. They come one time, two time, and then they realize, you know, you have to sacrifice some uh, spare time you know, for the different projects, if you want to really promote um, free software. So we, we always see people coming, you know, come two times and then leaving again. That's a, it's really unfortunate thing. In Switzerland, I'm lucky because we have uh, like a strong base of eight people in Zurich who are really dedicated for free software, who invest a lot of uh, time, free time, in the different project and that's that's basically really big motivator I think for me and also for Leo to continue this fight. Uh, that is that is I, I like the the reaching out to student thing. I think I think that's one of the things that um, I fully agree with. Um, also because they have a very long life ahead of them so they can advocate for a very long time. Um, I would love to hear, Bonnie, your response to how you, if you hear people talk about how it's going in Switzerland but also Italo, because you're a little bit in between, right, in the way you organize. So you're, the level at which you're, which you're organizing is um, a little bit in between the size of the organization of TDF and the local Zurich group. Yeah, of course, um, especially as we have an European point of view and not only like on one country. I'm sorry, my video is really lacking. I hope my voice is okay. So I hope you can all hear me quite good. Um, what I would say is that talks and workshops is really important. Like give people a chance to get in and to get involved and to learn how the process works and to also what I did with the public money, public code campaign, I documented how people could get on board and how they could, for example, what I did, contact local public administrations. And I put this on the wiki page and I made this available to all the people out there and I talked to them and joined local group meetings and introduced this that they could, for example, reach out to um, yeah, public administration for the public money, public code campaign. So it is also really important to break down big campaigns for them and to make it easy for people to understand what they are supposed to do and to also make it available for, of course, in different languages, as Italo already said, this is also a problem that we encounter because on the European level, we also have a lot of different languages. 
and yeah not everybody understands english and also translations are a really good thing to have and are really important to get people to understand what you're doing so so yes. so do you um do you within within your work do you organize also the translations to to happen already pardon like the, the, the yeah, yeah. Is that like I a key part them. of the work that you do? Yeah, this is one of the key parts I do as well, because I'm also the translator coordinator. And I do think this is also really important, but I think the more important thing is to organize workshops and to give talks and to show people what they can do and break down a campaign for them and make it easy for them to jump in. Because if it's such a big step for them to jump in, for example, with the public money, public code campaign, Reaching out to a whole government is way too big for just a local group. You need to break down things and to make it easy for people to get on board. And this is even like this is, I would say, the more the, fo the focus I would have. So, like with the public money, public code campaign, I broke this one down to only contacting local public administrations, like a small one, like the university or a library for example, so that people can have something they can grab and they can follow the steps and you can guide them. Yeah. Because that's putting something out there and expecting people to jump on and to be involved. I don't think this is working. You need to put it into small pieces because many people around the world doing small things, making a big movement. Yeah. Facing the big movement. Um, I I think that's that's very important as well. Also, like if you um, don't break it down enough, you can you can scare people away a little bit. Um, yes. Roberto, do you want to talk a little bit about what your experience is? Because you really sort of we followed you start a group from nothing. Uh, I know I know you had some challenges. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Um, so I would really like to first uh, say that. Uh, I take a bit after uh, Deb and, and Lisa. I was really inspired by them in um, kind of focusing more on instead of like the stick of like, hey, this is all the stuff that's bad with proprietary software, just like throw out a little bit more of the, the carrot and pepper, you know, and just, uh, you know, make all these like beautiful things and, and you know, uh, kind of show people how Libre software can help them flourish as people, right? And uh, I'm blessed that uh, there was a lot of, you know, grueling work, foundational work, very important work that has been done before me, right? And that, you know, I, I noticed that, you know, that we're in a position where there's a lot of good that we can do just with, you know, the, you know, the handful of tools that we got, let's say, right? Um, and something that made me very happy uh, recently was that I met this very beautiful, intelligent uh, Haitian woman who wanted to uh, help um, promote awareness of like, you know, kind of reduce the st stigma about uh, mental health issues in the Haitian community here and in, in Haiti as well uh, by making videos in, in Creole. And you know, she, again, she's very smart, she's very accomplished, and she just happened to not know that, hey, you know, you have OBS, uh, you have Kaden Live, and, you know, you know, you, you can make it happen, and, you know, you know, using these, um, these tools, you know, can help you, you know, accomplish these, and, you know, these great things that are, are so much bigger than, you know, that it, it's kind of about fitting you know, where we fit into the rest of like, you know, the human experience, I guess, you know, and, and all that, so. Yeah, but it's very, like it, it connects very much to what Bonnie is saying, is that you, if you break things down yeah. uh, into small steps, so basically st starting people off with one program, two programs, and then bringing them to a larger conversation. Um, I think that's very good. Um, so for uh, Jemmy or, or Leo, either of you. Um, one, I'm curious if you're now starting these conversations, if you're starting a group in France again, and if that is going better or worse um, than in Switzerland, because we just spoke to some French people and we know that 
like free software is, is quite a life there. So I'll go to Neo first. <laughs> no, that's Maybe. definitely not a plan. No, <laughs> no I'm just thinking to move out from France again. It is oh, not okay. so much my country here, but uh, that's another topic. I don't want to piss off any French people. I like them very much, but it's not my country. <laughs> I need an English speaking country. I don't even speak the language, so. <laughs> No, no, this is, uh, but I would like to step on uh, to what Roberto has said, because I find this a very interesting topic and also this can help a, a lot because um, I think we can uh, engage the people also to really pick this low hanging foods, which is, which are there, the software is good, we have really good usable free software, we can present them, we can offer them just as tools to people so they have an alternative. <laughs> And also what Bonnie has said, the thing with the workshops, uh, this is something which attracts a lot of people. We have done uh, several workshops on privacy topics. Uh, on the last workshop we have done was um, was on self-hosting, for example, how to set up your own cloud with Unohost or Freedombox and things like this. And it was a full house. It, I mean, we had uh, seats for 50 and 60 people was coming and 10 people had to stand in a row. <laughs> so there's a lot of interest in that. And this is really fun also, and it is really easy to pick. For me, this, I think, there we have to continue. This is always something we can do. But for me, uh, this is also what I uh, uh, tried to mention before. Uh, for me, the more difficult aspect, but also in long term more sustainable aspect is how to can, uh, engage those people that you have won there or that are interested. For example, in political campaigns, someone who wants to do self-hosting possibly has no interest in anything political. So how we want to engage these people in political campaigns? And we have, I would like just to mention one example. We have, for example, um, uh, made a little campaign, this, um, yeah, we cannot read your documents style. Um, where it was about that the uh, uh, public organizations were sending out work documents or asking for word documents and this kind of stupid things. And we have just prepared um, a font. We have used a free font and um, uh, transformed it so you cannot read anything. And then we have written a letter with um, the GPL and uh, uh, some sentences on it. And then we have written down um, here, uh, this is how we feel on our side when you, we get a Word document for, from you. So the, and we have printed it and sent it to hundreds of, of public institutions in Switzerland. <laughs> and this was, this is, yeah, but this is like a fun project. It has a political aspect. It is a very important topic, but you make like a game out of it. And this is, I think, another topic which people possibly don't like to hear, but I think it's very important. It is the gamification. You need to do something like this. You need to give also some, some goals. Okay, yeah, maybe I'm already thinking, for example, yeah, to, to give some kind of achievements. I don't know if you know Fedora. They have experiments with these badges where you get these little stickers with bumps panda beers on it and things like this. Uh, it sounds stupid, but it has a really big success, these little things, because it keeps the people motivated, it keeps them engaged, and it's a lot of fun, actually, also. And I think this is uh, this is one part that we, we don't have to forget, because, I mean, I live also from free software, but first of all, it's the fun that has to be in the, in the foreground. If we don't have fun in what we're doing, we can just stop it now. Yeah, especially if you're relying on uh, people to to volunteer their time also. Yeah, they need to actually enjoy what they're doing. Exactly, I think that's a very exactly. important point. Yeah. Um, Italo, do you have a lot of, you have, I mean, I, you've been with the Document Foundation for a very long time. Do you do, you do campaigns like that to help you grow? Uh, yes, we try. Um, actually, we, we are implementing uh, the same uh, badge concept that Fedora has implemented. Uh, twice a year, we we organize a month of LibreOffice where uh, we recognize contributors and uh, people uh, that is contributing during those months. They get uh, stickers, mugs, uh, um, hoodies. Uh, it depends from the numbers, so they they can get. Uh, uh they can be motivated uh, we try to recognize uh, uh people especially when uh, they're doing a good job in a in a specific community 
uh, we try to, although we, we refrain from giving titles like leader or, uh, uh, but we try to, uh, to, to use them uh, as, a pref as a preferred point of collection of the information for their, uh, for their uh, community. And this has proven to be very effective uh, uh, in uh, in several countries. For instance, we have a, an extremely active community in Taiwan that started from one single person. And uh, uh, we, we, we just empowered this person and he was so enthusiastic that started to uh, promote the software and uh, uh, today Taiwan is one of the most advanced examples of uh, use uh, of um, not that much uh, uh, LibreOffice but the ODF uh, standard in the public government which is extremely important. Uh, of course they most of them are using LibreOffice but the reason why they are using LibreOffice is because uh, as the best management of ODF and this uh, it's really important because uh, uh, we, we what we have realized is that uh, basically no one uh, is aware of the advantages of using, of using uh, real standards. Uh, on, on the other side I think uh, we are not doing enough uh, as open source in general to, to promote uh, open standards, to make it clear what open standards are. Uh, but when, I, when, when we manage to have uh, people that are decision makers around the table and explain the advantages of ODF, uh, you know, it's like looking at us and saying, oh, but that's clear, we should use ODF. It's, it's a no-brainer. Uh, and then you ask, but what have been, have you been using for the last 10 years? And they say, oh, of course, we use the Microsoft formats. And uh, um, we, we are uh, talking at the moment in Italy with a large uh, uh, military body. And uh, we, we provided the information and uh, the, the, and the presentation on, on the topic. And uh, when they went to the to the you know to the top layers with this with the presentation, the guy said, "Oh, but if the advantages are so clear, why are we still using uh, uh, Microsoft formats?" Uh, and uh, and of course, then uh, you, you have to say because there is a, uh, unfortunately there is a legacy of 10, 20 years of documents existing. Uh, that cannot be ignored. So what we suggest uh, is a is a migration path to to the new reality, uh, which uh, doesn't break uh, the situation. Of course, we have to balance uh, doing uh, these kind of activities, which are um, sometimes a little bit boring but very useful and do some uh, activities that are uh, more fun for, uh, especially for the young uh, generations. So we, we will uh, uh, launch soon. Unfortunately, uh, when we were ready, uh, the lockdown started, we, we will uh, start a program for universities where we, we will appoint students as ambassadors and uh, we will give a, a small stipend for uh, for six months, uh, similar more or less uh, in the concept of what Google is doing with Google Summer of Code. Not exactly the same because we are not, uh, our goal is not to develop the software, but is to create uh, awareness of the software inside the university. So talking with uh, with teachers, professors, talking with students, and uh, um, in some cases providing uh, reasons uh, why to use LibreOffice uh, for uh, uh, learning how to uh, program in uh, C uh, or to learn how to uh, program in Python because LibreOffice can uh, can uh, use macros in Python, so uh, 
to different approaches according to the different uh, to the different people and in some cases uh, just relating to what uh, leo was saying before uh, of course we have to do also uh, media outreach uh, and uh, that is uh, that is something is uh, is rather difficult uh, this uh, actually is the reason why i started into open source uh, because i have uh, worked in in public relation for now for 42 years uh, and um, uh, I started using open office uh, uh, because I was trying an, uh, to find an alternative uh, not to Microsoft Office in general, but to Outlook that I always consider the worst piece of software ever developed by a quadruman uh, just to reduce the number of people uh, that have been involved in uh, the development because they're human beings, but I say quadrumans to reduce the number. Uh, and uh, I stumbled upon Open Office, and I remember I sent an, an, an email to the to the to the project at, at that time. It was 2003. I said, "Oh, you you, you have a wonderful product, but your marketing sucks." And um, and I can uh, I can change a little bit. And he said, "What are you doing?" And I say, "I can just engage some some uh, journalist on uh, uh, on the." project in it the time was completely different but i remember that in italy we went from two million downloads to eight million downloads in a year in uh, in uh, less than uh, 18 months and, uh, and you did we, this by by getting more yeah, media it, coverage exactly it was uh, you know at the time uh, the 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 way of engaging media was completely different than today. Today, there is a lot more money involved in uh, placing contents. There's also at a the lot more saturation, of course. Exactly. Uh, at that time, I was the first to promote a, a, an open source software uh, just by sending out press, release by, press releases, byline articles, and so on. Uh, getting interviews, I remember I got uh, a full page on Sole 24 Ore, which is the Italian uh, financial daily. And that uh, the, the, the managing director of Microsoft was pissed off because they said, we, we pay a lot of money in advertising and you are promoting our competitors. And uh, the journalist said, but uh, you, you don't have as many things to, to say as your competitors. So just improve the, the way you you handle the media and uh, uh and and we will give you more space uh, so i was not let's say not popular amongst <laughs> microsoft people but not even uh, uh some people because i was doing this as a volunteer and uh, uh i got more coverage than sun pr agency so the guy at Sun asked me to stop uh, sending out press releases. And I said, oh, you can fire me tomorrow. Uh, no problem. And they said, but you are a volunteer. We cannot fire you. You got the point. So you, you cannot fire a volunteer. So either you sit at the same table and you understand how to work together or the volunteer will kill you anyway. Um, so I, thank you. That's a good, good little uh, summary there. Um, I wanted to ask Bonnie. Bonnie, do you how do you um, engage local media with your program? Because public co money, money, public code is doing pretty well um, in that sense. Because we're hearing about it all the way over here, and I think everyone has heard about it by now. So, what are the ways that you can? Uh, maybe you can speak a little bit one about sort of how you uh, use gamification to 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 get people involved, and then move into indeed how do you make sure that people know about you from a media perspective? Um, I wouldn't say that we use that much gamification because it's more about signing the letter and then talking about it. So there's not really a prize or badge that you could win from it. For example, you can, of course, get all the stickers. This is also a really important part. Maybe this could be seen as some gamification because we have these funny stickers and you have the share pics and everything like that. So yeah, there's still some incentive, yeah. Yeah, so they give probably some kind of gamification, but not like that was 
in the sense that was mentioned before with the things that you can bin or so you can trust or not trust it's also a really fun thing to do to create a share pick and you find the um the svt file on our download server download.fsfe.org and do a share pick for public money public code there and for the local media i would say it's basically just talking about them and reaching out to like publishing for example work that you find and that connect this one to public money public code for example there was this um cool free software that was used in a small town in baden-württemberg which is a part of germany and i saw this on twitter somehow i don't really remember now anyway and i got in contact with the people there and i talked to them and it was like oh this sounds really cool could we do an interview about this and i also connected this of course to our public money public code campaign because it was a public administration using free software and i did this interview and then a few days later um one of our technical um newspapers on the internet called netspolitik.org came over and asked me like sent me an email can we reuse this because this is a really cool story so just this made for example made it into the um local berlin newspaper then uh, online in the background story there so yeah that's just an example how things can work out if you talk about them and publish something that you find really interesting um Jamie, do you do you want to talk a little bit about if, if you've had any success getting uh local stories or or sort of local media involved no unfortunately not uh, we had some some media like uh, at the time pro linux and and stuff like that who published uh, a few uh, information about the workshops we have done but uh, let's say the mass media you know the newspapers and so on um, we never had any success to get anything anything published so what do you think the challenges are are in this i don't know if it's something to do you know that that uh, maybe open source you know together with business you know it's more an interesting you know interesting topic for for news media you know than like uh, free software and the ethics and the moral of of, of the software um so then it makes it really difficult and in switzerland you know it's it's a federalistic uh, it makes it even more difficult you know to reach out to the right people to promote the software uh, like in italy you know it's, it's centralistic they decide you know from today uh we just use uh, free software in switzerland it's like 26 regions everyone can do more or less what they want it makes uh, the same thing for public money, public code. You know, we have yeah. not been really successful here in Switzerland because of the federalistic aspect of, of the country. But the, I think that's a very important point. It's very dependent on, on the country, how the country's sort of press system is built as well. And um, May I add some? Yeah, please. Yeah. Um, because it's not completely to have some uh, press coverage, but uh, from my experience, it's very successful when you uh, target, at least from my experience in Switzerland, but also in Germany, it's very good when you target this local press, this town press or region press, and when you have a topic where they are involved, because for, I give you just a little example, uh, one of our fellows, Ralf has made a project where he has tracked OpenStreetMap uh, together with pupils in a school project. So he, uh, he they had this project week in the school and he went out together with the uh, pupils and uh, tracked OpenStreetMap uh, tracks. <laughs> And uh, this had been covered in the local press because it's the local school which was involved. It is something with kids. It's the pupils which were involved. So this kind of things work very good. Or for example, I have had a project where I was collecting old laptops and then installing new Linux and then giving them away for free to students and pupils again. And this 
I had a really good local media coverage with this and really big su success. I mean, hundreds of people called me afterwards and said, hey, I have a laptop or oh, I want a laptop and, and this kind of things are very successful. I think this cannot be underestimated. I'm, I'm sure we, when you want to get a New York Times or things like this, then yeah. you have to have bombshell news. Uh, but it is not about this. I think this little news magazines, this local news magazines uh, are so widespread and I also did not expect that a lot of people still read this kind of things. Also these yeah. magazines that you get for free in the post box, I'm not sure if they exist in your country, but in Switzerland they exist. Yes. I think I think those are those are very important points, um, and I want to add to that. So I also believe that local press is is doing a lot. And I uh, lived in Australia a little bit, and one of the things that worked really well there was going to the local cinema and putting your flyers there. Little things, you know, um, they can be really really helpful and really successful to just help you spread the word. Um, there are multiple ways of doing that. And every student, like when we are talking about students, every university, every student organization has usually their own channels, their own outlets, their own newspapers in some cases even. And uh, it depends, of course, on the size of the organization that you are, how much reach you're going to find as well. So I think indeed underestimating local attention um, would be, would be um, a miss. Um, I'm going to move to Alberto and ask you if you had any uh, successes that you think sort of helped you spread the word locally. So um, just funny story first, um, when I when it was just me and I first started, just just uh, I got this weird idea. I was like, let me see what happens if I just uh, uh, shoot this guy from NPR, like a quick email and see what he says, you know. And uh, and he was like, yeah, 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 you know what? That sounds really interesting. Uh, let me hear more about your work. I didn't have any work to tell him about. So, you know, I'll say, all right, let me, I'll get to that, I'll get to that. But there, and what I've realized is that people really, people really want to hear about uh, this stuff. And I think it's just a matter of like packaging it up and, and you know, whatever is relevant to them, you know. And something that I'm, that's kind of, I'm sitting here, I'm thinking about this now. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about like, you know, older media, you know, there's a lot of like, you know, like kids with like hundreds of thousands, you know, millions of, you know, uh, eyeballs on them. And they're just people, you know, so I feel like that's something that, you know, we can maybe leverage, you know, or, you know, I'm going to think about leveraging that to an extent, you know, on, uh, you know, I mean, it's already there. Uh, and, you know, we can maybe like sway some people over to use like some more interesting stuff. And, you know, if you get those big heads, like kind of saying, hey, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is something that's cool, interesting, you know, then, you know, so something. So, that, the, so the people that are in your group, uh, Roberto, how did you find, like, what were, what were your first steps of outreach? Oh, my first steps of outreach. So the very first person, so the very first person that was in my group um, was someone that was already kind of an FSF member. So, you know, you guys helped me find that. So definitely if you start a local group, reach out to the FSF, you know, become an associate member and, uh, you know, They'll, they'll help you out uh, to get it the ball rolling at least. And uh, then it was a lot of uh, kind of uh, me going out there, meeting people and uh, word of mouth. Uh, and then once the pandemic hit, uh, the, the nice thing that happened was that uh, since a lot of people just kind of shifted online and I happened to you know have a few things up on GitLab and some of my members set stuff up on, on GitLab and, and you know, some other code repositories and stuff, then uh, and I had the website set up and everything, then, you know, we just kind of started getting a couple of people just kind of like, kind of like poking around on the internet, finding us. And um, so that's really important to have like, uh, just, you know, stuff out there too, and like, you know, well-documented and, you know, appealing, I guess, you know, so, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so one of the things of, of what we can do as the FSF is indeed if you are starting a local group, um, you can reach out to the FSF and I'm sure the FSFE uh, would, would do the same, um, is you can reach out to us and we will help you connect to our channel so via our subscriber list and things like that to see if we can help you find members that want to join your group. Um, let oh, me... Sorry, yeah. also the Libra Planet mailing list. 
the Very Lima Planet Man. Yes, and the Lima Planet Wiki page, of course. You yes, can yes. also register on there. And so there are <laughs> many ways. Um, but the LP, the LP discussed that you can sign up um, from the um, Lima Planet's website is uh, an, a very active list with a lot of very active community members that you can also just ask questions to. So I think that's also, and that brings me sort of to uh, another thing is how do you talk to people that uh, don't know what you do or don't know what you're talking about? Um, maybe, Jambi, I'll start with you and then I'll move to to, to Bonnie. Um, how, do you, like, how do you start the conversation with someone uh, to convince them? You know, usually I, I don't start the conversations. Um, what we have is, is people, you know, uh, getting in touch with us, for example, at the repair cafes, where we make these GNU Linux installations for free, and they come with a certain problem. Uh, they don't like Zoom because of spyware and so on. Or they have a, an old uh, computer they cannot upgrade with Windows, whatever version it is. And so, so we try, you know, to take their, their problems and then uh, give them a solution and then uh, assure them that the software will do, uh, that uh, LibreOffice is uh, compatible with Microsoft as an open format and so on. And uh, usually I'm, I'm less patient, so I'm working with Enrico, he's a 72 years old biologist who helps me. And he's the one who really takes time to explain uh, about uh, the movement and why, what is the ethical aspects of this. And then we say, you know, what if you're uh, satisfied with the software, you know, please uh, try to convince uh, your friends and your uh, families to, to also to make the switch. So I don't go around, uh, you know, moralizing and portalizing uh, anymore. I wait until people come to me, basically. Um, uh, Bonnie? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> no, you're um, right. I would just um, add to this that, first of all, it's all it's time not to moralize and to talk to people like you're above them. Um, so it's also really important that people show some interest, interest into your topics and are willing to learn about what you're doing and what you standing for and then i would say i would start with the basics like for example with how i did it with the example letter that i had written for all the local groups to talk to um, local public administrations i first explained the four freedoms meaning what free software like share improve i'm sorry no it's fine <laughs> and read the code, so study and use. Yeah, so I would start with this and then I would also explain what are the advantages of using free software for them directly, for example, that they wouldn't have to reinvent the wheel and that if it's taxpayers' money, it should be public code. So yeah, just going with the basics and Keeping it easy, I think that's really important to, to, uh, if you talk to people who are not yet informed about what you're talking. Yes. And, and is it your, in your experience, are people, has because free software, of course, is, uh, it, it appeals to developers or people that are a little bit more technically inclined. So how do you, how do you, explain to them that they can do a lot and that they that this is something that is really important to them as well. Okay, so I would say that, it, for example, if you encounter a problem with a software, yes, and it's a proprietary software as loads of administrations are out, public administrators out there using it, then you can't easily fix it because you need to talk to the company selling you the software and you can't just give the code to somebody else and say, well, please improve this and this for me. And public administrations as well as individuals out there need sometimes a special tool or need, want to have something special and in a software or improve it or have a special function in it. Then this is really important that you can do this on your own. And this is a huge advantage that everybody, even a single individual can have. 
Like for example, with BitBlue Button, which is also a free software, you can use it in so many ways that there are no disadvantages for anybody. So this, I think this is really important if you talk to people who are not really from the tech community, explain to them that free software is not only there for tech people, it is also there for all the people out there not being technical, skilled, and yeah, it tries to make your life easier. Yeah, and and then of course it's connected to a much greater story as well, and that software is so ingrained these days in, in every aspect of our lives that you can't really yeah. talk about anything without um, including the software that you're using. Italo, is this something that you um, uh, run into? Like, what do you say to non-developers uh, that approach you about wanting to help? What can they do? Uh, I am a non-developer, <laughs> so it's easy for me. Uh, I have a degree in humanities, uh, and my degree goes back to 1978. So um, PC didn't exist. My thesis was uh, typewritten. And uh, let's say that um, I, I grew up uh, without computers. And uh, so when, when I first met the computer, my, my first computer, I was 27. And uh, sorry, you were 27 years old when you, when you had your first computer? Yes, yes, that was 81, and it was rather early because I, I had, um, I was hired, uh, I think, by mistake by uh, an IT company that was Honeywell at the time because I was a journalist. <laughs> so they wanted me to explain technology to non technical people. And uh, after six How did you months, do that? <laughs> Oh, I, it's not so difficult uh, if you if you if you put yourself. Uh, uh, I mean, I'm a user, so uh, it's not difficult for me to look at technology under the user point of view, uh, and uh, it's not even difficult for someone non-technical like me to to develop some understanding of technology. Uh, because it's not so complicated. Of course, I'm not. I'm totally unable to develop. Uh, and uh, actually developers are very happy that I don't even look at the code because uh, they fear that I can destroy everything just by looking at the code and not talking and not, not putting my hands on it. But it's, uh, you know, when people ask me and uh, they call uh, in, um, in Italy, we are used to give titles to people even if you don't know that they, that they have a title. So when I attend, I, I often talk at events and when I am at events they they tell me oh, um, they call me engineer which means uh, uh, is a kind of title like uh, engineer uh, uh, with a degree in a school of engineering and uh, when I say not not exactly I have a degree in humanities uh, which in it in Italian sounds even worse because uh, we we don't have the term humanities. We we use the term literature. So basically, my degree in Italian is uh, a degree in literature. And uh, then I say I'm over sixty, uh, and uh, I use a I've, I've been using now a Linux computer for years. And they look at me and say, How do you? make it and say because i have a neuron connected to my ends and that's all you need to use uh, free software is just uh, to to use you use software l like any other software there's nothing difficult nothing different of course if you want to set up a big server that's a different story but uh, this, no one would would ask a user to to set up a server and then they I make the example of cars. Uh, most cars today uh, run on a Linux, uh, on embedded Linux. And uh, so I, when I say, I tell people, uh, you know that you are using Linux basically because when today, if you have a, uh, an automatic uh, gear, uh, actually uh, probably 99% that is embedded Linux uh, that is uh, managing uh, the gears for you uh, 
uh, why you accelerate and you decelerate and they say oh so i'm a linux user i say yes you are a linux user <laughs> and uh, you know so it, it, and and you shouldn't be scared because uh, that gear or that brakes uh, or that friction which is basic based on linux is a lot more dependable than the mechanical one the mechanical one can really fall apart while the digital one uh, reduces the number of pieces and therefore makes it more robust so it's um, but if you think uh, we have linux in uh, in many appliances around us uh, and uh, and many people are using linux without realizing that they're using linux most uh, smart tvs are linux based uh, and uh, just tell uh, your neighbor you know that you are you're a linux user are you looking at netflix on your tv uh, probably the answer is yes and then uh, you can tell netflix has linux servers that stream uh, digital signal yeah. to your tv which is a which is a linux terminal basically yeah i think i think that's uh, uh, sorry the stream a... is uh, failed right now uh, oh. we're working can you still hear us though or not at all i can hear you but there, it's not being uh, okay okay we will wait <laughs> All right, it's back. Oh, cool. We're back. Um, I'm just going to summarize a little bit. I think what Italo was saying was that it's very helpful in your conversation about uh, free software and getting people introduced into the free software story. It's to talk about how free software is already ingrained in a lot of people's lives uh, and in a lot of people's systems without them knowing about it, how GNU Linux is at the core of a lot of systems. Um, of course, that doesn't make those systems free. So we don't want to um, <laughs> give them uh, too much credit for that. But uh, it, it is true that it really sort of is everywhere and that we that I think people uh, don't necessarily understand that. Um, Leo, maybe you can talk also a little bit about how you introduce people to the concept of new free software. Yeah, um, <laughs> I have a little bit different concept, or I think a little bit different in, the, in this kind of thing. So I have also thought like this years before, but I have changed a bit my view. Um, I'm also a very technical person. I work also in tech, and I like tech. But when I introduce people to free software, I never use technology. Nearly never. That's I think very the, interesting. Yeah, I think the political or the philosophical aspect behind free software is much more important. And this is where we get also the people. Of course, people are interested in, in Linux, and students like to hack and have something they can can work with and it is a better operating system actually um, this is it's just a fact um, but uh, to keep a long-term engagement and to keep the people really understand and think what is behind the whole free software ecosystem you need to come more from the at least I do it like this I I try to convince more from the political and freedom aspect because as you have said Italo um, we have Linux everywhere now everybody's yeah, I don't know the the number of Android phones in the world, but it's a lot. Everybody's using uh, Linux on it, and they are in chains if they don't use uh, a free Android version, for example. So uh, only using uh, using uh, free software does not mean you are free when it's not the ethical aspect behind it. Um, then there might be a free software component in it, but the users are still in chains, so that makes no sense. So th there has to be an awareness, um, and with this awareness um, comes, uh, f at least for me, uh, came a deep insight. When I started using free software, came a deep insight why I want to do this, why I'm doing this, and why I'm fighting for it. And, and I think uh, this is a very important point we have to transfer also to the yeah, I I think that's a very good point to be speaking to people's um, philosophical, if you convince them from a philosophical perspective or from an ethical perspective, you also, like anyone can find 
uh, their own truth in that and anyone can find their own connections to that because that also shows that indeed you don't have to be technical to believe that software should be ethical. Um, I am going to give the word to, to Roberto, like how you um, do a little bit of that outreach and then uh, I'm afraid we're already going to have to round up soon. Um, so, Roberto, how do you, like, and then I'm going to give the word to Greg a little bit. I know uh, they're waiting to to do a little bit of speaking on the FSF's behalf uh, when it comes to local group organizations. So, Roberto, how is it for you uh, to start a conversation about people and how do you convince them that they don't need to be developers? Uh, so, my experience has been really that if you're kind of just like living the life and putting yourself out there in a positive way, right? Uh, people get very curious, right? So, uh, you know, I had no spy break for like, you know, longest and, you know, I would still be out there and people uh, are amazed, right? They're like, well, how do you function? You know, how do you like, you know? And that opens up uh, things like that. Or like, you know, why, why are you using GNU? Why are you using you know, other stuff? Um, so that really opens the door to, you know, hey, this is like, this is better for you, right? This is better for you. So that's kind of the approach I take normally. Because the thing is that I, I I really like the philosophy. I get you know really into all that and and you know trying to break things down in different ways. Um, but ultimately, I'm barely smart enough to understand it. Uh, <laughs> and you know, I try to like um, just find you know what motivates these like different people and and try to and I see where free software kind of fits into that. And, it, you know, and just a, a, a kind of funny point is just that, you know, you'll you'll meet people that are like, you know, millionaires and they're like super fit and like, you know, they never miss a day at the gym and, you know, <laughs> uh, they're, they're so great in all these aspects of their lives. Um, and, you know, they're like, oh, wait, but like, you know, there's no way I can, you know, stop using this one app, you know? And you're just like, come on, really? like. You know, you can you can do it. You know, you can you can like you 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 have that power, obviously. You know, so um, that's kind of how I approach it. Nice, um, transcending. Um, I'm going to before I give the word to to Graham, I'm going to ask if anyone has uh, anything else to add that we feel that we haven't covered, that we should have covered, that is very important when it comes to local group organization. Um, Could I add something? Yeah. I think that what, like, there were many points mentioned there and all of those points are really relevant, but I would like to mention that the free software movement is really diverse and it's always really important that every organization finds their own way to connect with their local community and with their local groups and how to motivate them. Yeah. I think this is also something important and ongoing. Yeah. This is something that is really important. I also think that that's very important. And I also think it's, it's um, you, you don't have to think big. You can think small uh, and you can start small. And free software is very much about community. So think about your own community and what are the things that matter to them? And then talk to them about that. Um, great. I think, I mean, I want to thank everyone already in advance. I know Greg will also thank you again um, for joining in in this conversation. I like, I learn a lot from everyone else's experiences and I love hearing about how uh, the things that you run into internationally and I, I wish I could listen to every single one of you um, all day. I'm going to give the word to Greg a little bit. Greg. I mean, just listening to everybody speak has been really i mean i know that we're the fsf campaign scene but often just listening to people's stories of you know being a local volunteer is is like what fuels our work you know we do this uh full time but you know often there are so many things that we can learn from community efforts because it was uh local groups like that you know the software kind of spread right i mean at least in the 90s because uh People just couldn't go to whatever website, download a GNU Linux distro. It was all about that local outreach. And um, I think, especially now, you know, the quarantine, watching everyone become more and more remote, more and more 
uh, lockdown check software uh, has gotten us thinking that you know the FSF needs to do something to support support all these efforts. So like when the when it's safe to gather in person, uh, we want to be ready to hit the ground running when it comes to encouraging more uh, software adoption, encouraging more local free software groups. Um, happy to announce that we're going to be uh, putting to local free software groups. Um, we're going to help them in their organizational expenses, holding meetings, um, really uh, any, anything we can help them, like especially new ones, get up the ground running um, and rebuild ones. Uh, we just want to let everybody know that the FSF is here to help. So we're really excited to be offering uh, some reimbursement expenses to the local groups. You know, if you're planning a meeting and you, know, you needed to rent a space or do this, um, and you contact the FSF, uh, we'll be able to help you out with the monetary aspects of that. So that's really something that we're uh, pretty excited about revealing. Um, because it's just, yeah, as I mentioned before, it's just been so kind of disheartening on the one hand to see how many people have not turned to proprietary software to an increase number before because of uh, the quarantine. But when people are safe to gather again, we really want to those local efforts. Um, and so, and if you're starting a new group, uh, one thing we do do, as Zoe mentioned earlier, is we use our uh, internal subscriber list to send to uh, people in your area who might be interested. So I remember one of the first emails sent as a, an FSF staff member was about a, a free software group in Denmark. And so we know the free software community in Denmark, you know, we, they may have said, oh, yes, mail me about things that are going on in my area. So the group. Uh, you can rely on us to send that information uh, to them to hopefully connect you with people that you may not have been aware of before. Um, and there's also, of course, always the Libra plan, uh, which is where the uh, a lot of these groups have most of their organizational presence. But also, as Roberto mentioned earlier, um, when they discuss the general mailing list is like a constantly great source of uh, topics to be writing about and to share with the wider free software community. It's also a good place to find the people who might be in, in your area who you, you know, didn't really know about. So um, yeah, I'm really excited to say that we'll be, we'll be doing this reimbursement program. Uh, if you're interested, we're still working on the criteria. Uh, but if you, you know, are in some city where you, there's a free software group or there was one before um, and it was, you know, its last activity was a long time ago, you to write us at campaigns at fsf.org um, and we'll be on uh, the program because like I said, when everything is uh, as back to normal as it's ever going to be, we have to gather together again. I think we, both the FSF, we, and we as the free software community kind of come together and encourage uh, adoption, uh, free software adoption and advocacy for these local groups. So that's something we're pretty stoked about. And thanks everybody again. It was really uh, great to hear from everybody. I know I was a little bit uh, sad, mostly because I didn't want to, you know, mess up with the organization of everything. But it was a real honor to hear everybody, and it was really inspiring to us as uh, members of the community. I know for sure. Yeah, and I want to. I want to thank. Uh, I know Kelt just couldn't make it. Uh, one of our free software supporters from uh, Denmark, who. Um, jumped in just a little bit too late and would have been great to listen to as well we also had Christina we had I had so many people respond really nicely to to joining this conversation and I want to sort of course thank all of you Bonnie uh, Jamie Leo Italo and Roberto all of you so much for for joining uh, us in this what I'll do is I will uh, watch this again and then I will make a little summary I'll write up something um, trying to summarize uh, some of the lessons that we learned today uh, and then we'll publish that with the uh, on on one of the FSF's blogs because I think that's definitely worth it definitely yeah um yeah so thank you everyone uh, we're going to move to the next talk is uh John Sullivan our executive director who will uh, speak a little bit as to uh, uh, his uh, 
35 years or his 16 years, but our 35 years uh, of FSF. And then uh, I guess some of the projects that we're working on. Thank you again to all of you for joining us. I know this is like crazy times also, uh, one being online to all of the time differences. So I'm very uh, excited that we were able to make this work. Thank you. Thanks for inviting. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>